It's July, a new month, amen? So you got me for the next however many days July has, right? Amen? So please pray for me. I covet your prayers. Uh, already this week, the enemy, you know, ramped it up, felt sick, fighting something off, and then, you know, teenager troubles, right? Yeah. They're consistent in my house. Seem to never go away. So, so please pray for me. As you know, we try to do what God calls us to. There's always a fight. There's always opposition. There's resistance. Uh, just starting the month off, it's, it's already begun. Amen. So, so please pray for me and, and Ezra. He, he's going to a, dirt, a Christian dirt bike camp next week, all week long. So I'm praying that God would touch his heart as, uh, as he's going to, the word's going to be shared there, and then he's going to do what he likes to do, and that's riding dirt bikes. What a great combination, right? <laughs> dirt bikes and the word of God. So I pray he gets, he gets, God gets a hold of his heart there up in Prescott, Arizona. Amen. So let's pray. God, we just thank you that we have this opportunity to dig into your word tonight, God. It's always a privilege to just sit at your feet and just to listen to what you have for us, God. So we pray that you would move through the power of your spirit, that you'd touch hearts, that you'd break down walls, that you'd penetrate, that you would just be so precise with your word tonight, God. And we have come humbly. We have come to be taught. We have teachable hearts tonight, God. We're thirsty. We're hungry for your truth tonight, God. And we ask, God, that you would do just that. Speak forth your truth as we sung earlier. Speak your truth to us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, as you know, we've been going through Isaiah, and tonight we're going to be in chapter 42 of Isaiah. So if you want to turn there in your Bibles, that's where we're going to be tonight. If you need a Bible, raise your hand and someone will bring one to you so that you can just follow along with us, amen? And 42, Isaiah chapter 42. And as you all know, Isaiah is a book of prophecy, right? And we've, we've gone up until now, we've been looking at uh, just the, the coming, the second coming of the Messiah, right? The building of this new kingdom on Mount Zion, the tribulation period, the latter day prophecies over and over and over again as Isaiah has, has shown this to us through the, the extent of Isaiah, right? Chapter by chapter. And tonight, in 42, we're going to get another glimpse of just that, his coming. The first part of chapter 42 consists of Jesus' first coming to this earth as the humble, meek, sacrificial lamb to bring salvation to the world. And then we're going to look at, in the second half of chapter 42, the second coming of the Messiah as he comes as the Lion of Judah to execute just his judgment upon the earth. Amen? So as we're going through chapter 42, keep that in mind and just take note of the differences in his first coming to that of his second coming. And they're great. They're distinct, as we're going to see tonight and get a glimpse of, of, that, of just that. So with that, let's, let's begin in verses 1 through 9 of chapter 42 tonight. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax 
he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Amen. So here we have this first section in chapter 42. And, and notice the reference here to the word servant. Behold my servant. And notice that it's capitalized. Capital S. And, and in Isaiah, we see this reference to this word time and time again, the word servant. And in some cases, he's referring to King Cyrus. In other cases, he's, reserve, he's referring to the nation of Israel as his servant, as we're going to look at later in this chapter. And then at other times, he's referring to the servant as the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And in this case, it's the latter. Is Jesus the Messiah, his servant. And we're going to see why this is the case as we go on in this, this, this section. And keep in mind, context is, is biggie, right? Context. What, what are we reading here? What's the background? What's the history? We got to keep that in mind. So the word servant here, as we're going to continue to see, refers to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So notice here in verse 1, we also get a glimpse of the Holy Trinity, right? God the Father says here, I delight in my elect one. Speaking of the Son, Jesus, right? And then he goes on to say, I have put my spirit upon him. So we have God the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and then the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, which we cannot discount, right? We cannot discount the Holy Trinity. The world today will tell you that that's not the case, that Jesus is not God. We've been looking at this on Sunday morning, right? We've been going through the book of John. And it clearly lays out for us that Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And the Father is God. Amen? All three, one. And here we get a glimpse of that in Isaiah. As the Father says to the, his servant, Jesus, I delight in you. I delight in you. And notice the love relationship here between the Father and the Son. You know, growing up, I didn't have that so much with my father. We didn't have a good relationship, like many of us here. But here we see that laid out in Isaiah, that God the Father loves his son. And his son, in turn, loves the Father. Amen? It says in John 14, 31, Jesus says, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. He loves the Father so much that he was willing to go to the cross, to lay down his life, 
because he loved the Father, and the Father called him to do so. And not only that, but his, his, that same love extends out towards you and I, his great love, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What a love, right? This love relationship between the Father and the Son, and it carries over unto you and I. And now we, in turn, are to practice the same thing, right? What does it say in the Gospels? They will know that we are his disciples because we obey his commandments, because the love that we have towards him, right? They will know that, that we're Christians if we obey his commandments. So here we see this great love relationship. And we know that the Holy Spirit fell upon Jesus during his baptism, right? We've also been going over this on Sunday morning. Coincidence? I don't think so, right? John baptizes Jesus. And we know that in Matthew 3, 16, 17, it says, When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and a lightning upon him, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now does this not sound the same? I delight in my Son, I delight, my soul delights in my servant, and then I am well pleased. I am well pleased in, in my Son here as the Holy Spirit descends upon him. Amen? Yeah, and you know what? This was prophesied some 700 years before this even took place. Isaiah prophesied this 700 years before Jesus was on the scene. Doesn't that do something to your faith? I know it does mine when I see fulfilled prophecy in the word of God, it causes me to believe it even more so. It, it strengthens my faith. So here we see that Isaiah prophesied this before it was to come to pass. Seven years, 700 years prior to. And lastly, it says here that he will bring justice to the Gentiles. Our Messiah is about justice. You know, and that's lacking in our world today, right? Justice. Justice. It's a, it's a losing thing. It's a fleeting thing. Justice. Where's justice? Where's equity? Where's righteousness? It's not a thing that we see too often today, right? But it says that Jesus is going to bring about justice on this earth. Justice. Are you not waiting for that? Justice. Righteousness. When things are going to be made right, things are going to be made straight. You know, we, I went to, to the movies with a friend last night. We watched that Sound of Freedom. Talk about justice, right? Justice for these poor kids who are kidnapped and sold into the sex trade. Billions and millions of children every year that are lost to this wickedness. And the list goes on and on, the atrocities in our world today. But it says that Jesus is going to come and he's going to make things right. He's a just God. And if it were not so, he would not be God, right? He's going to execute judgment. So we see that God is going to do so. But notice that there must first be an empowering of the Spirit in order for justice to prevail. They go hand in hand, right? The Spirit and justice. And only Jesus will bring that upon our earth. And we're going to see more mention of this later in the chapter of justice. There's three references to justice 
here in this chapter. And this is the first of three. And then in verse 2, we see that his ministry is characterized here of that of what? Meekness and humility. As he came to the earth first, at his first coming, he came in meekness. He came in humility. And this is how he came to the earth. He didn't come with a bang, a boom. He didn't come with an announcement, hey, I'm coming to this earth, right? He didn't yell it. He didn't scream it from the rooftops. He came lowly. He took on human form, yet God. But he came humbly and meek. He didn't come with a sword. Instead, he came in gentleness. And he did not come to judge the world, but to save. And we're going to see that in his second coming, right? He comes in judgment. But during his first coming, he comes to bring salvation to the world. In meekness, in humility, as the sacrificial lamb of God. And verse 3 When he first comes, he will not break the bruised reed nor snuff out the dimly burning candle. You know, the reeds would would break with with a strong wind. They'd be hanging over. And that dimly lit candle. Instead, he's going to come in tenderness even to those who are most vulnerable and powerless. He's not going to break that reed. He's not going to snuff that candle out. But instead, he's going to come in tenderness. Tenderness, gentleness to those who are vulnerable, to those who are powerless. And isn't this the way that he came to you and I? You know, I didn't listen to the guy who was screaming Jesus at me. I listened to the loving kindness of Jesus Christ that ultimately led me to repentance. How about you? Was it his loving kindness, his tenderness that led you to him? And that's how he came to this earth. Meek, humble, lowly, gentle. And doesn't he ask that of us as well? Take my yoke upon you. For I am gentle, I am meek, I am lowly. Are we not to behave in the same manner today? Not letting others to walk all over us, of course, but to be gentle as we deal with others, amen? Because this is how Jesus came to the earth. This is how he drew those who were vulnerable and powerless and weak Unto him. But notice this isn't going to be the case during his second coming. He's going to come in fierceness. He's going to come in anger and wrath and judgment. Notice the difference here. In Matthew 12, 15 through 21, quotes this same passage as Jesus fulfills it completely again some 700 years later. Amen? So another instance of fulfilled prophecy. If you want to read that later on, Matthew 12, 15 through 21, this same passage is quoted by Matthew some 700 years later. Amen? It just proves the the. Ver- the veracity of God's word. And then verse 4 here, we see that he will not give up till justice is established on the earth. He's not going to let go of that. He's going to bring forth justice in due time. He's not going to fail. Our God does not fail. Amen? He doesn't give up. When things get tough, he doesn't throw the towel in. He sticks to his word. He does what he says he's going to do. Unlike man, right? Sometimes we don't keep our word. We fail one another at times. 
We quit prematurely. But here it says that God will not fail. He will accomplish his perfect will. And he will not be discouraged until justice is executed upon the earth. Amen? This is our God. And notice how he will establish justice on the earth. It says it's through his word. His word. Justice is in his word, the law. His word is justice, amen? And that's how he's going to execute justice on the earth. And then in verse 5, moving along, it says that God the Father makes it very clear that he's the one talking here, right? He reminds us that it's God the creator. Reminds me of Genesis chapter 1. God created the heavens and the earth. He's saying the same thing right here. I have created the heavens, and I have created the earth, and I have created man in it. And they only breathe because of me, God the creator. He says, listen, it's me who is speaking, God the creator. I give life, and I am God. And he speaks to his son, who he calls in righteousness. And we know that Jesus, while on this earth, was without sin. He came fully man, but he sinned not, right? He came in righteousness. He came and sinned not. And here God says, I've called you into righteousness. And he holds his hand. In other words, Jesus is not alone. God is with him. And aren't you so glad that our God, too, holds our hand? Amen? Amen? Amen. You know, I, I was thinking of this. When Ezra was a lot smaller than he is now, he's almost as tall as I am, if not taller. But when he was a little kid, I'd hold his hand when we crossed the road or we crossed the street or we were in a busy park or at the beach. or I, I held his hand and I took him to safety. I led him, I guided him by his hand, and he freely gave me his hand during that time. Now that's not the case. He won't even dare come near me, right? He won't hold my hand. But it says here that God the Father holds the Son's hand. Isn't that amazing? And we too can put our hand in his hand. And allow him to lead us to safety. Allow him to lead us to those green pastures, that clean water. And he can deter us from situations in life that might not be so good for us. That they don't have a good outcome. And this is our God. He also takes us by the hand. And he walks with us. And he talks with us. But we just got to put our hand in his. Amen. His hand is extended towards us. We just got to grab a hold of it. And take hold of him. Amen. So here we see that God the Father holds his hand. And we don't have to figure this out on our own. Amen. He's with us. He teaches us. He leads us. He guides us. He takes our hand in his. And then he says that he's a covenant to the people. A covenant. Something that is not broken. It's not disbanded. It's forever. It's eternal. He's made a new way for man to be redeemed unto God the Father. All through the cross as he laid down his life through death so that we could obtain it. And he fulfilled it. Amen. He's the new covenant unto mankind. He made a way where there was no way. And it was a cross. And he took our place on the cross so that we could then be saved if we so choose to be. Right? This new covenant through Jesus Christ. And he also says that he's a light to the Gentiles. 
And again, we've been looking at this on Sunday mornings, right? He's a light. He's a marvelous light. He loves the Gentile too. And he extends his light unto them. This light draws one out of darkness. He's brought us out of darkness unto his marvelous light. Amen. His light exposed that sin to our, our very selves, allowed us to see it for what it truly was. You remember that day when his light shone upon you and you saw the condition of your humanity, your sin nature, and it drew you to him out of the darkness unto his light? It says that he is a light a light unto the Gentiles. And then in verse 7, we see his earthly ministry. Why did he come to this earth? Why? Well, it says here, to give the blind their sight. Not physical sight, but their spiritual sight. To give the blind back their sight. And Oh, to be able to see the truth, right? He's exposed our sin to us. That we may turn from it and, and see it for what it really is. And then it says that he also came to set the captives free. To set those who were in bondage, to liberate them. To give them freedom. You don't have to be in a literal prison to be in prison, right? You know, I was in prison, but I know that there was also people out here that were in prison. They were locked up. They were in bondage to sin, whether it was drugs or alcohol or just a lifestyle of, of, of just yuck, right? They were in prison. But it says here that Jesus came to liberate those who were in bondage. And we know that ultimately he's going to liberate the nation of Israel from their captivity of Babylon. But he, to he's, he too is going to come and liberate those who are in bondage to sin. Amen? And how many of us here tonight he has done that for? He set us free. He's liberated us from, from that heavy heavy ordeal that, that we once faced. You know, he holds the key to that prison door. Jesus is the key to that prison door that has anyone in, in bondage to, right? He's the one that opens and unlocks that door and allows him to be free of it. He's a chain breaker, amen? He's the liberator. He's our deliverer. He's our redeemer. And there is no sin too big for him to set us free from. And Simeon testifies of this scripture in Luke 2, 25 through 32. Again, more proof of Isaiah being true. We see it being quoted in the New Testament. In Luke chapter 2, 25 through 32, Simeon, he testifies of this. And then in verse 8, Lord, the Lord says, I am. In other words, I am sovereign. I am God. And he does not share his glory. Amen? Especially with idols, nor his praise. He and he alone is worthy of our praise and glory. Amen? Without him, we are nothing. He's the one who has is, who is set us free. He's the one who has saved us. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of all of our glory, right? We have done not a thing. It's all been him and him alone. Even the angels in the elect in the book of Revelation will cry out and give him praise. For he is worthy of it. Amen. No one should receive 
glory but him. From our lips, from our hearts, from our minds, from our souls, he should be the one that receives all of that glory, all of that praise. You know, when we start hearing ourselves say, well, I this and I that and I this and I that, beware. Because ultimately it is he who has done. He and only he. Without him we're lost. We're nothing. So it says here that he will not share his glory with another. God receives the glory and it's only due to him. Amen. And then he goes on to say here that former things have come to pass. In other words, up until now, we've been looking at what? Syria. Assyria's invasion upon the nation of Israel. We've saw, we saw the Babylonian conquest and them taken into captivity. So these are the former things that have taken place up until now. But now God says that a new thing is going to happen. And that new thing is God is going to deliver the nation of Israel from the hand of Babylon. This is the new thing that's going to take place here. The deliverance is coming for Israel. And notice here that our God knows all things. He knows all. Even before they come to pass. This is our God. He sees the beginning from the end. He's outside of time. He's not confined by time. Amen. This is our God who sees the future and he sees the past all at the same time. And here God says, I have seen what is going to come to pass. That which is going to spring forth, I tell you of them. So moving on, let's read verses 10 through 13. It says here, sing to the Lord a new song. And his praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it. You coastlands and you inhabitants of them. Let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voice. The villages that Kedar inhabits. Let the inhabitants of Selah sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord. And declare his praise in the coastlands. The Lord shall go forth like a mighty man. He shall stir up his zeal like a man of war. He shall cry out, yes, shout aloud. He shall prevail against his enemies. So here we see there's a praise that takes place. A praise of God with a new song. And that all the nations of the earth will praise God for he's coming again. Amen. He's coming again at his second coming. And as a mighty man, and he will cry out with a loud shout. With a loud voice as he conquers his enemies. Remember in the first coming, he comes quietly. Even when he performs miracles, what does he say to those he has just healed? Don't go and tell anybody, right? Don't go and proclaim what I've done here. But now we see during his second coming, he's going to come with a loud shout. He's going to come with a sword in his mouth. And he's going to vanquish his enemies. Unlike his first coming, he's going to come with fierceness, right? Revelation 19 describes this in detail for us. It's a great read. It speaks of Jesus coming on the white horse with his word, executing judgment upon his enemies, right? With his sword, the sword of the word. And out of, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. And then he, ex- he will exact justice upon the earth. And lastly, verses 14-25 refers to his second kingdom, right? So let's read those. 
verses 14 through 25. I have held my peace a long time. I have been still and restrained myself. Now I will cry like a woman in labor. I will pant and gasp at once. I will lay waste the mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will make the rivers coastlands and I will dry up the pools. I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. I will lead them in paths they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and not forsake them. They shall not be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed who trust in carved images, who say to the molded images, you are our gods. Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as he who is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant? Seeing many things, but you do not observe. Opening the ears, but he does not hear. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will exalt the law and make it honorable. But this is a people robbed and plundered. All of them are snared in holes, and they are hidden in prison houses. They are for prey, and no one delivers. For plunder, and no one says restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will listen and hear for the time to come? Who gave Jacob for plunder, and Israel to the robbers? Was it not the Lord? He against whom he, we have sinned. For they would not walk in his ways, nor were they obedient to his law. Therefore he has poured on him and the fury of his anger and the strength of battle. It has set him on fire all around, yet he did not know. And it burned him, yet he did not take it to heart. So here we see in verse 14, that he will come with a shout as a woman in labor. And we've seen this reference time and time again, right? A woman in labor. He refers to his second coming to that of a woman in labor. It's eminent. There's no holding him back as a, as a woman giving birth, right? It's going to happen. And have you been in the room when, when, when a woman's giving birth? Have you heard her shout and cry? Yeah, it's a loud thing, right? It rocks your soul. It, it, it just does something, right? It moves you. Well, Jesus compares his second coming to just that. He's going to shout with a loud voice. And he's going to come back to the earth a second time as a woman giving birth. It's eminent. There's no holding him back. And it's going to take place, right? It will be birthed, his second coming. And how many today say that, well, he's not coming back, right? How, how many years has he been saying that for? He's coming back a second time and the scoffers, and the mockers, and you hear them, right? But we know that this is going to come to pass. We see it over and over again throughout Scripture as he predicts his second coming. It's coming. It's imminent. His judgment is due. It's time to give birth to that judgment upon the earth, right? To exact just justice upon all that which is not right. And then in verse 15, he says that with that judgment, he's going to bring what? A great destruction. It says that he will level every mountain, every hill will be made flat. And we know that in Revelation, it speaks of great earthquakes, 
They're going to shake this earth to its core and bring every mountain to nothing. It's going to cause islands of lands. It's going to shift the continents and move places where they once were. He's going to bring about a great destruction upon this earth, referring to the great tribulation period, right? In the book of Revelation, that troublesome time. He's going to destroy all plant and tree life. Think of that. No more greenery, no more shrubbery, no more trees to take cover under from the hot burning sun. Just flat desert as the sun beats down on the earth. Nowhere to take cover. Nowhere to take refuge. And then he says that he's going to dry up the waters. No more taking a cool dip on a hot day. As the sun beams down on the earth. The great tribulation period is what he's describing here. And then 16 through 17, he says here that we get a glimpse of his miraculous hand upon his remnant, right? Says that he's he's gonna take them and lead them during this troublesome time. He will lead them to safety, to light. He will straighten their path. He will cause them to turn from their idols. During these last days, God is going to work miraculously upon those who choose to believe him rather than the Antichrist. Amen? It says that he's going to make a way for them. He's going to lead them to safety. He's going to protect them. He's going to provide for them. He's going to allow them to endure to the end of this this time period. Only God's hand will allow them to be saved, right? God's mercy and grace as they go through this time. And then 18 through 20, he says, hey, listen up, you deaf. Watch. Look, you blind. Referring to his servant Israel right here, right? Here's another reference to that word servant. But in this this portion of scripture, he's referring to the nation of Israel. He's saying Israel Listen up. Open your eyes. You have my law. But yet you do not believe. He gave his word, he gave his commandments to the nation of Israel. But what did they do with it? They disobeyed it. And instead they turned to idols. They turned to idolatry. They turned to their own ways. And here God is saying, you're a deaf people. You're a blind people. I've given you my law. I've given you my word. But yet you've disobeyed it. You've walked away from it. And isn't that what he's done to us here today? He's given us his word, right? Are we like Israel? Are we deaf? Are we blind? Do we not hear his word? Do we not see it? Or do we hear it and see it and believe it? And do it. Unlike the, the, most of the nation of Israel in that day, they neglected it. They had it. They received it. But they chose to, do, to, to walk towards those idols and to serve them instead, right? But here God is saying, listen up. Listen up. Notice their condition. Their condition mentioned there in in verse 22. They're plundered, they're looted, and they're trapped. And this is a condition of man without Christ. Amen? They're looted, they're plundered, and they're trapped. They had his word, but yet they chose to walk away from it. And we know that ultimately... They were led into captivity by the nation of Babylon. And they were plundered as a nation. Remember what 
what the king of Babylon did to, to the temple. He removed every article of God, every gold, every piece of gold, every piece of silver was stripped from God's temple when the Babylonians came and invaded the nation of Israel. They were stripped. They were looted. And then ultimately, they were led into captivity. They were trapped. All because of what? Because of their disobedience towards God. God gave them their word over and over and over and over again through this prophet and that prophet. Over and over, he shared his word with them. He shared his heart with them. And what did they do? They put their hand up against God and said, we, not, we want nothing to do with that. Give us another prophet. We don't like what he shared with us. We want another truth. And ultimately, God said, enough's enough. And he allowed the Babylonians to plunder them, to loot them, and to trap them. Because why? Because he loves them. Because he loves them. And God loves us. And he's not a, a, going to allow us to get away with our sin. He's going to discipline us. Amen? Amen? And this is what he did with the nation of Israel. He disciplined them out of love. He led them away into captivity so that they would turn their hearts back to God. And he does the same with you and I, right? He disciplines us when we get out of line, when we drift away from his word, and we hear another word over here that we, we'd rather listen to. And he leads us into captivity. He allows us to, to go back into bondage. And if we receive that discipline, it will work towards repentance, right? It will lead us back to a place of, of, of repentance, to turning away from that sin. And here we see that God did that exact thing with the nation of Israel. He says, listen up. For I am the one who disciplined Israel for their disobedience. I turned her over to her enemies, that being Babylon. And notice the callousness of their hearts here. It says here in the latter part, in verse 25, it says, It has set him on fire all around, yet he did not know, and it burned him, yet he did not take it to heart. They were getting burned up, and they didn't even know it. That's how callous they were of their sin. He came to his own, and they did not receive him. As it says in John, right? They rejected him, even in the midst of his loving discipline. And we have two choices, as Israel did. To receive him and walk in his ways, or to reject him and to walk in our own ways. We have a choice to make. We can be like the nation of Israel, who walked away from him, and thus was led into captivity, or we can choose to obey him now and to walk in his grace, to walk in his mercy, to walk in his love freely, right? It's our choice. Who likes to be disciplined? No, it hurts, right? It hurts. And sometimes it hurts longer than others. But God loves us. And he loves us so that he's going to discipline us. Because he cares about us that much. And we see his heart in this passage towards Israel. So we can respond in repentance and avoid this coming judgment. Amen. Today is a day of salvation. Not tomorrow. Today. Amen. So as we close this evening... I don't know if we, we can share one last song and close in prayer, but just keep that in mind tonight. God's heart towards us 
is that of a loving heart. His desire is that we would obey his word. To walk with him hand in hand. Because we see that his second coming to the earth is going to be so much different from his first coming. And there's no escaping it. Only through the blood of Jesus. Amen. So if you would stand with me tonight, amen, as we close. We've had enough of getting everything we want. And we are weary of living this life just for us. And don't forgive us all seeking your hand and not your face come and empty us Father we're desperate in this place Holy Spirit fill us with your fire give us your desire hold us close God, we thank you for speaking truth to us tonight. We thank you for your love towards us, God. And that in your first coming, you came gently. You came humbly as the Lamb of God, offering salvation to this world, to whomever would receive it, God. And we thank you for making that way for mankind to be redeemed unto God the Father. We thank you that you are the new covenant of life unto us, God. Your body, your blood, given freely for us. But we know, God, that you're coming again. And this time you're coming in judgment. You're coming in wrath. You're coming to execute justice, God. And we pray, God, that we would escape that day that we would get right today, God, and not later. Lord, we desire to walk with you. We desire to obey your word. We pray that your spirit would move amongst us, God, and that you would prepare us for your second coming. And Lord, that while we are here on this earth, we too would be kind and gentle to others and that we would point others to you, Jesus, as we've experienced your great love towards us. I pray your blessing over your, your body tonight. Give us strength. Give us courage. Bolster us up in these last days to stand for that which is right. That's our desire, God, to honor you and to give you all the glory that you're due, all the praise that you're due, God, that we would not have take away from any of that, Lord. We bless your name tonight, and we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you. Good night.